Trauma Center and the University of Chicago Trauma Center. I welcome you to the 12th lecture in our series on ethical issues in violence, trauma, and trauma surgery. It's my pleasure today to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Kimberly Joseph and Reverend Carol Reese. Uh, Kimberly Joseph is a retired physician uh, who worked for many years in the Division of Trauma and Burns at the John H. Stroger Hospital of Cook County. Um, Dr. Joseph received her MD from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York, did her residency in general surgery at the University of Illinois College of Medicine here in Chicago, and completed a fellowship in surgical and critical care at Stroger Hospital. Dr. Joseph cared for patients at Cook County's trauma program uh, beginning in 1993. Reverend Carol Reese is chaplain at Stroger Hospital and a licensed clinical social worker. Reverend Reese also is a co-principal investigator and program director of Healing Hurt People Chicago. Uh, you may remember that the clinical director of Healing Hurt People, Brad Steinbach, gave a lecture in this series about two weeks ago on the programs, that is, the Healing Hurt People programs work to facilitate trauma recovery in children and adolescents injured by violence. Reverend Reese came to Stroger in 1986 when she was working with the Southern Baptist Convention. Until 2002, Reverend Reese was the executive director of the AIDS Pastoral Care Network. And in 2005, she returned to Stroger and in 2010 became staff chaplain uh, at Stroger. Dr. Dr. Joseph and Reverend Reese talk today is entitled, as you see it behind me, Primum non Nocere, When Is It Our Moral Duty to Do More for Our Trauma Patients in Need? Please join me in giving a warm welcome to uh, you. So thanks everybody for coming. Carol and I um, are very honored to be here. We want to thank the McLean Center and Dr. Siegler for inviting us to come and speak with you all today. Um, I need to do a shout out before I get started. Abner, Nympha, and Mary Lou, please stand up. Uh, Abner, Limpha, Nympha, and Mary Lou are our three of our very dedicated trauma nurses at County. And um, even though this is going for publication, at least I'll speak for myself, maybe not for Carol, but you're going to hear me refer to it as County. Um, I have never, except when I had to speak for the media called it Stroger. So I apologize in advance. We're going to be talking about county. I would like this to be somewhat interactive. Carol and I are going to tag team this a bit. We're going to ask some questions, not with the idea that there are right answers, but just to kind of get people thinking of some things. So the first thing I want to ask, which I think all of you are probably better versed in this type of thing than I am, in your opinion, What's the difference between morals and ethics? Moral is as a general in everything. Ethic mostly is related to the conduct. What's good, what's not, what is right, what is not, what is justice, what is not. But the moral is in general moralities of uh, <clears throat> almost everything in okay. that, and but often it's mixed together. Right. One means something and means the other. Okay, so I'm going to just repeat in case people didn't hear. He was talking about uh, morals, sort of being a larger, larger, per, larger in concept. Morality, the, yes. Say in religion, in ethics, mm -hmm. in politics, and. But ethics mostly the conduct of our behavior mm -hmm. on a daily basis, do's and don'ts, and yes. what's right or wrong. So I think the, the conduct, as, as I've always understood ethics, 
I agree with you. It's really something that is externally put on us in some way about how we should behave, yeah. um, what's appropriate conduct, whereas morality, uh, a lot of people would argue morality is something that is bigger and perhaps also more internal, but I would say probably also societal, and that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. And my next question before we really get started, which I don't want an answer to, mm -hmm. is for you individually, in something in your life, is there anything that you consider to be a moral imperative? Okay, if I don't trip, and right. there's a couple of trauma go. centers, a <laughs> couple of trauma surgeons here. So first off, we don't have any disclosures. What Carol and I are going to do is take you through some cases, but also take you through kind of the journey that we went through when we were first asked to consider doing this. And one of the things that when we were trying to put this together, and we talked about this a little bit a couple of hours ago, is that the words have meaning, the language is important, and one of the things that Carol and I, I won't say discovered, but maybe rediscovered, was that a we, a bit of it, yeah, w is that we needed to go back and actually look at the language about what we do and figure out, number one, are we doing it? But number two, where did it come from? And by looking at where it came from, that also helped inform our answering, are we actually doing it? So our understanding of what cure actually means, what care actually means, what hurt actually means, where does that word come from, what does it actually mean, what healing actually means, both the current use and also where it comes from. So we'll start with a case that I had many years ago titled, Why'd You Even Bother, Doc? So this is a guy who came in by report, jumped in front of a train in a suicide attempt. He was unstable on arrival. We ended up having to intubate him, all the things that we would normally do for an unstable trauma patient. His left leg was essentially near amputated. We completed that actually in the, what we, you would call your emergency department. We call it our trauma resuscitation area. He also had a very mangled left arm. We took him to the operating room, finished the amputation on his uh, left leg, also uh, did some repairs, muscle debridements and things to his left arm. We get him through this process, resuscitate him medically, what we would consider to be successfully. We get him extubated, and the first thing he asked me when he woke up, we had him, took the tube out. First thing he asked me is, why would you even bother, Doc? Why did you even bother? By this time, we'd had him for a few days. He knew that he'd lost his left leg. His, right, his left arm was essentially not able to be used. He couldn't use it. There was so much nerve damage. What do I do now? So if you had known that the patient wished to die when he arrived, now think ethically and morally, going back to what you're saying, did we actually do the right thing by this patient? If you would have known beforehand that the, the intent of this patient was to end his life, did we do the right thing? And I'm asking not because I expect that there's a right answer to this, but I'd just like to know what you think. I do. <laughs> and I'm very patient. <laughs> I am very patient. I've been an ATLS instructor for 20 plus years. I can wait you out. <laughs> well, I guess I would say that what immediately jumps to my mind is that the basic premise by which we perform emergent treatment for patients who can't give us consent is mm -hmm. that we presume that they would prefer to live than to die. Yes. They would presume to, to retain function rather than lose function of what a mm -hmm. limb or organ system. Mm -hmm. um, and you're basically suggesting if we don't have that presumption, can we still treat yes. emergently? That's what I'm asking. And so, I, get, and so I, I suppose using that framework, we have to say no, at least, or at least that we have to find some different framework in which to understand our, our presumption of the imposition of our treatment on yes. the patient in an emergency situation. Okay. And okay, I, I, and I think that's absolutely legitimate. Uh, there's somebody behind you who's going, shaking his head. So 
tell, tell me what you're thinking. So I guess it's the question that arises is whether there is such a thing as a rational suicide, right? And okay. Whether, whether suicide, suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior by its very nature is pathological and therefore, you know, and I think that's the question that you're really grappling with is, is yes. can, he, can he rationally decide that he wants to commit suicide? Okay. What if you knew that the reason that he did not want to go on living is that he had Huntington's chorea and he was going to, he knew he was going to die in a matter of a couple of years anyway, horribly, um, that there wasn't going to be any treatment? Would that change the way you're thinking about it? I think it's a harder question, but okay. I still think that a lot of palliative psychiatrists and people are not sort of, I mean, I think it's more complicated than just saying, well, he has a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's it's an easy way out for us mm -hmm. to not treat underlying depression and not treat underlying psychopathology. Okay, and we're going to come back to that. Go ahead. So I'm not a physician. I'm, I'm looking at this from a patient's point of view. Or yes. From my own particular point of view, I very strongly believe in a right to die in an individual's mm -hmm. decision, in right to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And I would say, uh, if it were me, I would say the same thing as the patient had said. However. I've also seen studies that say mm -hmm. that perhaps the majority of patients, and if this is true, the majority of patients who are saved from suicide are thankful for it yes. because it's an impulsive decision mm -hmm. and they wish they could take it back. Mm -hmm. So assuming that the physician has no way of knowing mm -hmm. what this person's real feelings and real intentions were, I reluctantly have to say, yes, you did the right thing. Okay. And I That's went through... Idea. Yeah, well, I, and I have to say, I went through, in my mind, feeling actually pretty sure that this was intentional, just based on the description that was given to me at the scene, and still made the decision of, well, for some of the things you talked about, was this something that if we had another chance at it, could we treat him? Could we have him feel a little bit different, not knowing the medical history? And ended up with... This, this decision that I made, knowing that probably this was an intentional act. So let me take it one step further. You can see the second question up there. What if he had said, not whether or not treat me or don't treat me, but don't intubate me? I've seen people in my family, and they've been on life support. I don't ever want to be on life support. He's decisional. He's awake, and he can tell you, I don't want to be intubated. It's Bill, right? That would be the kid. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, can we assume that he's decisional? I would think mm -hmm. that in these circumstances, you may very well not have decisions that you can find a better framework to explain your answer. And again, I think that's legit, too. If you're saying his blood pressure is low, does he really understand what's going on? We use that argument a lot in people who we kind of suspect may actually be decisional, but we don't want to do what they want us to do. So we say, well, his blood pressure is low. He doesn't really understand what's going on. So the reason that I'm presenting this is because really if you look at then what goes on to happen to him is that he, he, he has no real nerve uh, function in his left arm. His left leg has now been amputated. We get him an electric wheelchair. It lasts for maybe two months. It breaks down. The insurance won't replace it. He's unemployed. He has chronic pain. He has difficulty now in all of his relationships. He's intermittently homeless. I follow him for about two years and then lose track of him. Um, I don't know what happened to him. So I did find sort of at the end of this road asking myself, did I behave ethically in this case? Which in some ways for me was an easier answer. But then asking myself, did I behave morally in this case? Which was a harder answer for me. Um, so we, you all, I'm not going to read through all these things because this is really your area of expertise for a lot of you. What are the, eth what are the domains of medical ethics, at least modern domains? And I would say that we did our best to do no harm. We really did not recognize his autonomy because we, I, well, I, I won't say we, I'll say I did not think he was capable of being decisional. And at first, when I first saw him, I acted in what I thought was the patient's best interest. We're going to get back to that also. Um, tried to treat him with respect, but again, there were circumstances that led to that not happening. 
the bigger question to me really is a moral question. Did we cure him? And that's when you have to go back and start looking at what's the origin of the word cure. So if we look at it from relief of a disease or something that we fixed, something that cures a particular medical problem, then yes, we cured him. But what do you think is the actual origin of the word cure? I hear I heard wellness. Say it again. Cure is heart. It's heart. Cure is heart, sort of. Is has like cardiac cure, okay? So it's interesting because when we were looking this up, one of the things that we found was that the root, the Latin root of the word cure has to do with souls. So if you think of the old word for priests, curates, it actually has to do with treating the soul. And I would argue that in this area, we failed miserably that we didn't ever completely address the cure for him and the care of his spirit, the care of his soul. I think back on him a lot about what I would have done differently, and we'll hopefully have a chance to talk a little bit about that. And this idea of looking after somebody, and we'll talk in a second about care, Carol's going to talk more about healing, but we were entrusted not just with his body, we were entrusted with him, with his person, with his soul. And I will, I call this a failure on my part, that I wasn't able to somehow help his soul. Now, somebody, some are sitting back there, and I have to admit I do periodically just to get through my day, say, well, there's a limit to what you can do. And yes, that's true. I would like us, by the end of the time that we have together, to push that limit a little bit further back and not use that as a crutch and start thinking in terms of what are the things that we should be doing, whether you see this guy or not, to make sure that you are able to treat his soul. What are the things that we have to do? And for me, that's a moral question. That's not an ethical question. How about the origins of the word care? Did we care for him? Yeah, I think for, by some definitions we did care for him. You can see some of the more modern definitions up there. But one of the most modern definitions is that the provision of what is necessary for the health, welfare, maintenance, well-being, and protection of someone or something. And again, I would argue that in this case, we failed to care for him, not just individually for me as a physician, but there's some place upstream in this patient's course where we, as a profession, fail to provide care for this patient, fail to provide what was necessary for his well-being. And we'll talk more about that. These are some of the other definitions, but the one I really want to focus on, because we're going to keep coming back to it, is this first one, the provision of what is necessary. Go ahead. Just to be clear, yes. based on what you said before, I've been at this point in your thinking several years ago, where you have uh, been less aggressive. So I probably would have done the exact same thing in terms of my medical treatment of him and notice that I am not using the word care. That's deliberate. I would use this, do the same medical treatment for him. The care of this patient actually needed to start before I saw him. And part of what we have to define for ourselves is what are we doing to care for people that we are responsible for and we are now medically as healthcare providers, as ethicists, we are responsible for the people who require health care in this country. And if that's our definition, then our notion of what care is changes. It's not just the medical treatment, it's what are we doing to make sure that patients have access to the kinds of resources that will prevent this from happening. 
um, and we're going to push into that. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to make sure Carol also has time to talk about her case. Yeah. Exactly. So what I think has changed to some degree is my degree of agitation, disruptiveness, uh, whatever the word is you want to use now, whatever the cu current word, is about making sure that this guy didn't have to jump in front of a train to get care, to get care, not treatment, mm -hmm. to get care. And that's what we're going to be talking more about, what's the moral and for us, for me, the moral imperative. So even if we pass the ethics test, and even if my treatment of him would have been the same, one of the things that Carol and I did as part of this journey, looking to see what are we doing with regard to cure, the soul part of this, and care, what is necessary to maintain well-being, to maintain health. That's a bigger issue. That, I would argue, is a moral issue, not an ethical issue. And this is basically what I just said. So we are, Carol and I, as part of this journey that we are on, continue to be on, but really as part of putting this together, looking at what else do we need to do if we're going to reclaim the word cure as the care of souls, if we're going to reclaim that, what do we have to do to make sure that that happens for our patients? And it has to happen upstream. But I'm going to now turn it over to Carol. Well, I think the other thing that we're doing is trying to have us all kind of look at this language that we use a little bit more in depth and a little bit more broadly. Because uh, if you go back to some of these slides, the, the connecting cure with the healing of a disease wasn't the original meaning of the word. It happened in uh, English-speaking countries as they began to, uh, in the 14th century, as they began to connect those two things. So it was uh, probably healthcare professionals. Well, it who happened because in the 14th and 15th centuries, there were things that could be cured. But if you think back, there were a lot of things that just could be cured. The only thing you could offer was spiritual support, right? And then we get to a point where there are things that, quote, could be cured, and that's the word now morphs into something different. And it's not that the new meaning is not legitimate, it's just that we've lost, to some degree, the old mm -hmm. And my argument and Carol's argument is that we've got to now put them back together. Great. So this is our second case study. Um, in, at Stroger Hospital, I should use county, shouldn't I? We should be consistent. <laughs> I've been talking to the press a little bit more frequently than you, so I've retrained myself. Um, uh, we've had have the privilege of working with a lot of young people, um, and I find these kids, mostly young boys, quite amazing. And I want to introduce you to two of them, uh, Jonathan and David, who are cousins. Jonathan is outgoing, always looking for an invitation to perform. David is shy but thoughtful. The two of them are inseparable and share a kind of sweet interdependence. They lived just a block away from each other and they were both shot in separate incidents near where they lived. When our team of outpatient trauma intervention specialists first met the boys, they were both struggling with the physical and emotional complications of their injuries because it was uh, just, we encountered them just after they had been injured. Neither of them was in school, neither had a job, they were both often hungry and looking a little bit disheveled. David used copious amounts of marijuana to cope with his PTSD symptoms, and I mean copious amounts, smoking up to 13 times a day. Jonathan immersed himself in rap music, writing lyrics and looking for places to record and perform. But during the spring and summer, we were able to help both boys to begin to deal with their PTSD symptoms and find support with a group of boys and girls um, who understood their struggles. And they began to blossom. They both got summer jobs. We were able to convince, conjole, drag them both back to school. Um, during the summer, neither had been in school for more than a year, 
And when the first day of school hit, David was sober and they were ready to roll. About three weeks into school, we received a call that there had been a fire at Jonathan's house. Eight people were asleep in the house, including both Jonathan and David. The only way out of their second floor apartment was to jump from the bedroom window. Everyone was panicky and not thinking or seeing clearly because of the smoke and the fire. David jumped first to encourage and to help catch the others. Now Jonathan's family is homeless, living with friends and relatives. Their already tenuous financial situation had become dire. But the most difficult thing they had to deal with during that period of time was that Jonathan's little sister, Brianna, died in the fire. She did not make it to the window to jump to safety, and no, no one was able to find her in the house. The boys felt guilty and responsible. They should have been able to get her out of the house. They both told us after Brianna's death that she was the one person in their family who told them how proud she was that they were going back to school. It made her happy to see them doing something good for themselves. The boys said very frequently, we have to finish school. We have to make something of our lives. Brianna believed in us. And while they have found strength in remembering Brianna in this way, both Jonathan and David remain in a very dangerous place, both physically and emotionally. They were shot. They lived in the same neighborhood where they were shot and worry every day about their safety and the safety of their families and friends. They went to sleep in the one place they felt safe and woke up to a house on fire. And the only person they, who really believed them, in them, a little girl, died. In the year or so since the events that I described, several other things have happened to these, uh, these young men, now young men. Um, both of them have become uh, serious artists blowing glass in our Project Fire program that I know Brad spoke to you about a couple of weeks ago. Um, both of them are peer leaders in our program. They help facilitate support groups and they are trainers uh, for the Healing Hurt People program and our trauma-informed care training programs that maybe some of you guys have participated here um, at UFC. A couple of not so good things have happened. Um, David was shot in an incident in which his uncle was murdered and died in their home. They were shot on the front porch of their house. Um, Jonathan, while he's remained not uh, un unreinjured, well, that's an inelegant way to say that, but while he hasn't been injured again, he's had a couple of close calls with the police. Um, he was arrested um, uh, because he was sitting outside the home of a white woman who called 911 because she didn't know who that was sitting in the car outside of her house. And then on a second occasion, a few weeks later, was rousted out of the car by the police because he was, again, sitting in his car and uh, was in a neighborhood where he didn't belong. Trauma teams care for people with physical injuries who've been knocked about and very often treated unjustly. Um, we talk a lot about injury in our profession um, and talk about it in terms of, often in terms of the physical harm or damage that's done to someone. Um, but the other origin of this word um, if you look at kind of the more archaic uses of it is that this is a wrong or an injustice or something that has done harm to someone, which isn't necessarily related to a physical injury. And the word for hurt um, comes from an old French word, uh, hurter or to knock. Um, so I wanna, it did evolve into a metaphor for wound and harm. I think what we want to talk about for a little bit with you guys is that the, the young people that we serve uh, primarily in our unit are young people, as I said before, who have been knocked about and treated unjustly. Um, 
So I want to talk a little bit about the broader context of our work. Uh, trauma is a disease of uh, young men uh, primarily. Um, Forty percent of the deaths among men of young men of all diseases, I mean of all ages, are due to unintentional injuries. You guys probably know these things. You may or may not know that the leading cause of death of young black men in the same age range is homicide. And you can see where homicide shows up even under as the second and third leading causes of death in younger black males. Um, and then suicide and then heart disease. I mean, I have kind of a twisted sense of reality sometimes, but I think about this you know, you, you survive homicide uh, up to age 34, and then, oh, you're going to die of a heart attack. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the context in which uh, health outcomes um, for young people are um, way more challenging than we would like to see. Um, we were here last, a couple of weeks ago, I was here last uh, when uh, Brad talked about adverse childhood experiences. Um, this is another um, context in which we are working with our young people. Um, adverse childhood experiences look like this, um, physical and sexual abuse, emotional abuse and ne neglect, um, parental separation, incarcerated household members. A lot of our young people um, deal with these adverse childhood experiences. 70% um, of our kids have had three or more of these adverse childhood experiences, and 21% have had five or more. Um, one of the things I think we may not have talked about a couple of weeks ago is the impact of um, race and uh, um, um, institutional racism in this country and the, um, the legacy of slavery. Um, so there are a group of people working on these um, things who talk about racing aces, um, that a lot of our kids have experienced the adverse childhood ex uh, um, exposures that we talked about, that I just talked about. But for many of them uh, below, I mean, it, that's just the tip of the iceberg for a lot of our kids. Um, that uh, just by being young and African American in this country, you have, uh, before you're even born, experienced trauma. Um, another thing that um, our kids deal with is this cycle of violence, um, past trauma. Um, within five years, 45% of our patients are, are re-injured. Just by being shot puts you at higher risk of being shot again, and 20% are dead. If this is without any intervention at all. Um, the other thing that um, our kids deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis, you heard uh, that in the story, embedded in the story of Jonathan and David, um, but these kids hear gunshots, they've been jumped, they've seen a stabbing, they've had family members who've been murdered. Um, so this is the group of questions that we typically ask um, our kids to assess what their violence exposure has been. Uh, anyone want to venture a guess as to how many, on average, how many of these community violence exposures our kids have had? There's a list of 14. Oh, come on, somebody. 10? 10. 12? It's not quite that bad. 7? Mm -hmm. 0.7, almost 8. I mean, I don't know what happened to you when you were growing up, but those kinds of experiences were not part of my life. Um, and I don't know if I would still be standing, if I would be standing here today at all. Um, I'd like to think that I would be that hopeful and resilient and there'd been people in my life who would have picked me up and carried me through, um, but I don't know. Um, and for those who have screened positive for PTSD, 
um, among our patients, I mean, among our clients at County um, and Comer, eight, almost nine types of community violence. Um, prevalence of PTSD symptoms is very, very high. Um, if you just take a look at this seven, almost eight um, percent of the general population, you would expect to find, I just saw you, hey Carlos, um, uh, eight percent in the general population would screen positive for PTSD symptoms among our pediatric adolescent patients, almost 48%, so almost half of them screen positive. Um, for those who had witnessed a homicide, 100% of them screen positive. Um, and some data that I think Brad has been collecting would show, uh, the latest data that he reported, I think last week, is that 65, upwards of 65% of our kids suffer from PTSD symptoms. Can I just jump in? Yeah. One of the things that gets lost as we're going through this is that you can get shot and you're not going to 100% necessarily have these PTSD, these causes for PTSD. But if you witness a shooting, and that goes back to what we're talking about with the cure and the care, it's not that you've been in, you had the physical injury, it's that you've seen someone else and it happens. So your perspective now has to change about where is our moral responsibility. Why, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I just have a, a, a question. Whoa. Um, a slide or so ago when you said that, um, you know, you were sharing with us that these uh, children or young people had had these various experiences, and you said, um, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but that, you know, like you had not had that in your life. Mm -hmm. I guess I, so as I think about the moral and ethics of that, I mean, of, of the conversation, I, I go back to what what relevance do you think you sharing, making that comment has to the overall conversation about this? And, I, and I'm, not, mm -hmm. I'm not saying yet, one way or other. I guess I'm thinking that it made me think certain things, but I want to be clear mm -hmm. as to what your intention was, because I sure. feel like I, wa I wasn't sure and I did, and I couldn't keep going through the slides with you because I felt like that must have meant something because you said it, but I don't know what it means. Um, you please? Sure. Yes. What it meant for me when yes. I said it yes. is, uh, I don't know that I would have been able to be a hel healthy whole human being and still standing here today and being able to survive all these types of exposure to violence. I don't know if I would have been able to cope with all of that. And so what I'm, for me, what I'm talking about when I, uh, I guess the subtext that I didn't say is that these kids are incredibly strong, incredibly tough, and incredibly resilient. Um, they make connections with their families, with their friends that somehow sustain them through this. Right. Go back to that, and I want to say to you that even though these kids look like that, these micro stressors are having an impact on their lives, and 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 I think could be wrong, but that's why the same group you're looking at flipping them, you know, 10, 15 years out, and there's all this heart disease. Yeah, because, absolutely. Because what we know right. uh, from Dr. Nelson's work at Rush was that. These, the same group of people have a really high rate of miscarriages mm -hmm. and multiple miscarriages because of all of these systemic micro stressors that the society continues to tell us these people are resilient. These people can, these people are not resilient. These people can, I mean, and I'm just, this is my opinion, but it appears that there is so much water that goes over that says these people are resilient, they, do what you, you know, they can make these, and they can, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I cannot leave that piece of the conversation without saying that there are extensive micro stressors that are happening to these people, us people, whoever we are, mm -hmm. that are real. Absolutely. And that these other, this, so I don't, I don't want you, I guess I'm challenging you not to to celebrate that resilience, but to also acknowledge 
that in creating this strata of experiences for people, that there is not just this violent downside, but there is this downside that they are carrying these generational stressors right. that are impacting us as a society generation after generation after generation. Right, and that's what these slides were about. Um, that, I mean, even just the, um, the list of adverse childhood experiences that in this study from a, several years ago, um, those stressors led to social, emotional, cognitive impairment, health risk behaviors, early death, um, and this even, it's even worse here. Maybe we didn't spend enough time here, but um, the history of structural, ra of uh, slavery and structural racism, white supremacy, all of that. Um, I mean, I was just, I keep having to look up this word allostatic load, but that's just the wear and tear on your body, right? Just from, just from being born black in this country. Um, yeah, and, but, I, but I think it's interesting because what you're, what I'm hearing you challenge us on is actually the use of the word resilience, yes. Yes. Mm. and that's yes. good yes. because that's part of what we are trying to work through sure. all the time is the meaning of the word and what is what is it being used correctly, yes. and I don't know. I think we want to, as you said, celebrate whatever it is that gets these kids far enough along that hopefully they get to Carol and to her team and Brad so that we can maybe change, interrupt that cycle. But you're absolutely right. If you read the original ACES study, these were, this was done in you know, Kaiser Permanente's mm -hmm. population, right? And we saw that these types of exposures led them to physical problems, asthma, diabetes, heart problems, and then take this now where people have these additional exposures. And I would then challenge all of us, if resilience is not the correct word, what is the word that we want to use here? And maybe we want to use a different word. And Pringle, I think that's you Well, I mean, I, I think resilience is not a bad word, but I think the problem with it is the whole idea that it normalizes mm -hmm. what is happening mm -hmm. yeah. in the population of people. Yeah. They can survive it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the social structure mm -hmm. of the way that, it can be a little yeah, yeah. so I think there is resilience, but mm -hmm. it's undermined by the idea that this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that's the, way that's the end of it. It's yeah. not, as you said earlier, it's not an ending, it's actually a process, and then what do we do with that information? Mm -hmm. Well, that's sure. part of the moral challenge then, is going to be yeah. what what is, is the resilience the, the word that we use, is there a better word? And what do we do it's with that? It's in context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think what, what we're talking about is um, in, a, in a different slide. I mean, part of the reason that they're, we've been working on these hospital-based violence intervention programs is that you do something here while they're in the hospital. We make a connection. We offer you know, some support, some intervention that's pretty intensive. Uh, and as long term as it's necessary. The young men I talked about before, we've been working with, what, Brad, for three years? Um, so um, they, they weren't resilient in and of, well, they might have been resilient in and of themselves, but they're in a much different place than they might have been had they been left to their, their own devices and left to the, the continue continual exposure to trauma that their family has experienced. Um, and maybe talking about developing the resilience. I mean, I, one of the things that struck me, here, I'm familiar with the case, but one of the things that really struck me at the time was that their first call was to Carol. When this happened, their first call was to get in touch with their trauma intervention specialist. And that was, a, to me, a building of, or capitalizing on whatever resilience they've been able to develop. Is it the right word? I don't know, but now I've got to think about that. <laughs> right. Well, and we, uh, you here, and then Brad. It's wonderful that you see the thing the way you see it, 
But suppose you were omnipotent person. You mm -hmm. had everything in the tip of your finger mm -hmm. that you could do. Mm -hmm. How would you cure this? Mm -hmm. Because we talk about cure. Yeah. How do you cure it? So I'm going to defer that till the end because I think. <laughs> so she's going to defer that to me. It's like, no, no, oh, no, thank no. God. I <laughs> thank, thank God. But, but I think the question, we got this question earlier today. Yeah. How do you, and I'm going to change it a little bit. How do you operationalize what we're talking about, right? What is the thing that we are asking you to do? Um, and I do want to say that to the end, because I do want to kind of try and put this together and say, here are some suggestions about things that I would say, based on moral imperative, we must do. Um, but there will be my ideas, and the challenge will be to have everybody start thinking about this. What are the, what goes to the first, second question? What is your moral imperative? If you were, if you had to look at the whole picture, how are you going to operationalize yeah. it? What's your moral imperative? So, Brad, Wait, Brad. I think we have three questions. Well, yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. So, Brad first, and then I didn't get your name, sorry. And then, <laughs> just back to this resilience point, which I think is really um, helpful that you're raising this because yeah. we're struggling with it. Mm -hmm. That it, it's very hard. go through, right? But sometimes the result of that is the only thing that people see is the violence or the, the trauma. Mm -hmm. The same way if, if we talk about the resilience and it erases the impact of what's been done to them by us, which is why we want to then uh, we're, we're really doing them a great disservice. So how do you hold both of these at the same time, right? How, how do you think about the resilience people are still acknowledging and uh, not erasing the rage, the grief, the pain, everything that they've had to overcome to make it to the point that they're at. Um, so that was just my comment. And I think we could spend far more time with this discussion. I don't want to take no. any more of the time. Um, I have a question here and then. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if the word recovery would be a replacement word. Because in any healing situation, there's a process. Yeah. Well, if the definition of resilience is you use only your inner resources, none of us are. Yeah. Right? I don't, uh, th there's nothing that I have overcome and recovered from in my own life experience that I've done by myself. So if that's the definition, the working definition, then we absolutely need to excise that from our language altogether because that really is not at all what happens. I'm going to throw out the suggestion of survival. I'm going to use the analogy of um, military combat troops. When they're in a combat environment, they're surviving and they develop, they develop uh, tactics and habits that enhance their ability to survive an environment. And then when they return, many times they call themselves survivors of this environment. And so if these kids are injured, they go back to the same environment and they're still out there on the streets trying to survive. So they're Thanks. not really survivors yet until they get out of that? Okay. If they're not going back to the same environments, yeah. no. it's okay. the same as if you're wounded, you know, 
you go to the combat aid station, they match you up, and you go back to the FOB, and you're still at risk for mortar or cyber mm -hmm. round or anything mm -hmm. else. I want to ask Dr. Sigler a question. We had sort of embedded conversation throughout the presentation rather than stopping at five and then having a conversation. Is that okay to Absolutely. keep going that way? Yeah, you guys have to call us later. Okay. No, I know. I know what time it is. We won't be here that long. Um, so, are most of you from Chicago? Many of you? No? no a lot of Some of you? At our meeting, a lot of people? Okay, area. well this, in the, the blue and white uh, areas are the city and the city limits. Um, the dots represent uh, homicides in the city. So what do you, s and these two little, I mean the circles, yeah, the, the dots are homicides. The two red dots are roughly county and UCM. And someone was asking time frames that we're talking about here. Uh, this was uh, with a year, within a year. I think this was data from 2016. Uh, commentary on the map as you're looking at it. What do you notice? They both are 11% of trauma, each one of them. Equal homicide and uh, Suicide is equal each 11% of all trauma. The only thing is that suicide is more serious because people shoot from clothes. So then, and they usually put it in their mouth or put it in their head, clothes or so resistance is gone. So most of the suicide dies compared to only, but it's equally each 11% of trauma. For all trauma, but gunshot. Yeah. Well, f and for some trauma, but when you when you stratify for race and age, oh, it's it's extremely the more. Different. Yeah, it's very different. What else do you notice? A lot of dots. Huh? A lot of dots. A lot of dots. <laughs> yeah. So what about here and here? Who's Chicagoans? What who, what are these neighborhoods? All right, and what else do we know about those parts of the city? Yeah, primarily, uh, these are, our city is extremely segregated. These are mostly parts of the city where black and brown people live. Um, it's also, you know, high rates of poverty, poor housing stock, food deserts. Some of the, I have taken some of our young men home after a group meeting and there's not a grocery store anywhere <laughs> to be found uh, within, you know, many, many, many blocks of where they live. There are few businesses, few jobs, the schools tend to be underfunded and underperforming even if they're Chicago public schools. All Chicago public schools are not the same. Um, Transportation in and out of these parts of the city is difficult. Um, and then, of course, this community violence piece. So again, this is another just sort of visual way to think about the stressors that people live uh, within this community. I didn't get to update this slide, but I was at a meeting um, over the weekend with a bunch of uh, healthcare uh, executives. You were at that meeting. Um, do, you remember what, do you remember what they said about the life expectancy here in the loop? 85 years of age. 85 years of age. Um, so this is our hospital. It's just right out the Congress Expressway West. You get to about right here in the Garfield Park neighborhood. What's the life expectancy? Huh? Young children. No, what's the average life expectancy? How long? Six, 69. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, so just, you go five Four. miles Four miles. west. Do the math. And to your point earlier, the stressors are there um, of, of all of these things. So, you know, 
if I, if I had a magic wand, there'd be a lot of things. But I, I kind of hate putting this slide up here, but um, you mentioned um, military a little bit ago. Um, one of the things I think we've been discovering with many of our young people is um, they have for many, many years of their life been in situations where they've done things or been forced to do things that they that violate their moral code or their ethics. And they feel bad about it. And they feel like they don't deserve to be alive in this world. Um, they're in that definition, they can no longer be regarded as decent human beings. So this is one of the areas that, um, particularly for me as uh, an Episcopal priest, I get really concerned about, because that's, you know, that's a matter of who you are in the depths of your, of your soul and your sense of who you are as a human being that has been damaged. Um, yeah, so I just said that. Um, injury and hurt, I mean, with these, these two boys um, that we talked about, um, you know, I think we did all of the ethical things right with them. Um, but I don't know that we've significantly addressed their sense of injury, injustice, um, and the ways in which they've been knocked around in the world. Um, uh, trauma people, are any of you guys in this? Oh, no, maybe not. Um, we believe that with the right intervention at the right time, we can save a life. And that's why we're doing this program um, in here at Comer and at, and at County um, to try to intervene at some point to promote healing. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through these quickly because I know Kim is going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, but again, healing has is, is been conflated, I think, in our minds with, and not inappropriately, with disease. Um, but it also is talked, healing rec <laughs> refers to restoring to wholeness or health or to an undamaged state. We are not going to restore ourselves to our undamaged states. It's an aspirational thing, um, but I think healing can happen um, for, uh, because I've seen it with our kids. I think we can hopefully restore some sense of wholeness, uh, help these young people restore wholeness um, to try to ensure that they're not hurt more. Um, and that takes that's going to be a long, a long-term project, and then um, they're, they're restore a sense of these are human beings as as holy and whole individuals. Um, and again, what do we do? Yeah. So to be respectful of people's time, I'm not going to go through the third case. Okay. We're going to kind of go to the end because I know that I know that people have lives that they want to get to. Yeah, that's fine. So let's turn the lights up again and see yeah. if we can sort of answer the question that you asked. So um, I'm going to skip ahead to go through all of this. This was something that was actually written in response to uh, a set of incidents that happened about uh, patients who came in who were obese and this idea that somehow they were at fault for what was happening to them and what was our responsibility. Um, and the first responsibility was to care. And I would argue that the first responsibility was to care, to cure, to try to prevent or ameliorate injury, to heal, that all of those things were together. And the question is then how do we operationalize that? How do we, I'm not omnipotent, but what do I do? So my moral imperative that I'm gonna share with you is that we have a set, we have a group of people who are systemically disadvantaged with regard to their health. And it is my moral imperative to change that. And that I think it's not an ethical issue, it is a moral issue. So what does that look like for me right now? For a variety of reasons, one of which is sort of has to do with current politics, 
I have been in the face of more legislators in the past 12 months than I have been since I was 18 years old. That is part of my moral imperative and the thing that I'm talking to people about and I'm saying to them, here's my experience, use it, I can tell you from first-hand experience this is what this looks like. My moral imperative when I talk to these people is we have got to look at mental health and treat it with the same way, treat it in the same way that we treat issues of defense, issues of national security, and that this has to be routine. This is not separate from what I do as a trauma surgeon. This is part of what I do as a trauma surgeon, and it is your responsibility to make sure that I am able to do that. Now, in, ingrained in that moral imperative, we were talking about sort of what happens in a hospital or in an institution. Ingrained in that moral imperative is that you have to have a recognition that this isn't going to happen tomorrow. But I believe I'm morally responsible, knowing what I know, to make sure that it doesn't ever get dropped, that it is in somebody's face all the time. That's one moral imperative I have. Another moral imperative that I actually decided years ago and that I did, I feel like I've had some success with, is to make sure that everybody that I train has some part of my moral imperative. So in other words, everybody that I train since 1993 has been trained to look at things other than setting the fracture. So you get screened for child abuse, you get screened for domestic violence, you get screened for substance abuse. The thing that we only recently were doing is asking questions now about what are your community exposure, your community violence exposures, and making sure that you get to those resources. That's another part of my moral imperative. It's not about ethics, it's not about the conduct of how I conduct myself as a physician. This is my moral imperative. The last part of my moral imperative is to, and this I have not done well at all, is to force the conversation about societal racism. My, one of my mentors uh, from DC, that there's no such thing as race. You'll recognize, yes, there, I have a, Dr. yeah, Dr. Callender. There's no such thing as race. Um, but it's the term that is used, and it's the only term that people are going to recognize. And we have to force that conversation, whether it be in regard to immigration or health care, which to me are linked. Um, that I have not done, and that's something that operationally, that's something that is my next part of the moral imperative for me. And I guess what I would say is the challenge that I would like to issue and that I think Carol, hopefully, also would like to issue to all of you. I was your boss, so yeah, so yeah, so <laughs> she has no choice. Um, but to actually ask yourself that question with regard, to you, we're all here because we're re in healthcare. What's your moral imperative? What is the thing that, not ethically, morally, you feel you have to do in order to treat, care, cure, heal the people that you are seeing? The treat is easy, actually. The treat, we've got tons of textbooks that tell us how to do the treat. The care, the cure, and the heal, I think, are the hard parts. And we, that's our moral imperative. That's what I would like all of you to find, to figure out for yourself. What is the thing that you feel you have to do morally to get your patients healed? To do, if resilience is the wrong word, to figure out what is that thing that we capitalize on in, that's intrinsic and then bring in the extrinsic factors in order to get people to heal. And that's going to be a different thing, I think, for every person. But it's a question that, I, that we both think you have to ask yourself because the moral injustice here, the injury here, is that there, are, there is this group of people who have these exposures who are systemically disadvantaged and systemically not healthy because we're just treating them and we're not caring or curing or healing them. And let me turn this back over to you okay, so you can. I'll say one thing real quick. I'll, I'll stand close to you. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I'm actually, this, I'm gonna <laughs> this give looks this weird, to you. right? This <laughs> weird. Yeah, yeah, 
uh, I didn't mean to make it, make it weird. Um, but, but one of the things that I wanted to say about, uh, to follow up on what Kim was saying, is that for me, inherent in the language that I use around healing and health and whole and holy is the belief that people do have, and we all have, intrinsic within ourselves um, resources to do that. And we also, most of us have external factors that make that very difficult, if not all, if sometimes impossible to do. Um, and uh, part of the, the conversation about cure and cure of souls, when I talk to my bishop about where I work, he asks me, where's your cure? Well, my cure, my place where I do my work and care for people is the hospital. But that's, um, that's the language that we use in my profession. Um, and, I, and I would hope that um, part of what Kim and I hoped to get out of the day today is just push us a little bit to think about the language that we use, how it's connected to our own values and belief systems, and our own sense of who we are as moral human beings, um, and let that drive what we do in the healthcare settings where we work. And then this is sort of the second to last slide. This is really what we're challenging people to do. Um, and it's going to, be, as I said, it's going to be different. It's going to be different for each of you, which is good. That's how it should be. And we'll stop and we'll answer questions.